Merci beaucoup. Merci. Merci. Donc nous finissons la journée avec. Thank you. Now we'll finish with the last debate. Artificial intelligence. What freedom of decision remains? Unfortunately, Luc Ferry could not be with us because his mother, who's 93, hurt herself. Uh, she fell down, so he's hospitalizing her in southern France, and he apologizes. So uh, these are just uh, the things that happen in life, unfortunately. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Here we are. Let's get started. Artificial intelligence. I'm happy to work on the subject because it's my only chance. Secondly, we're going to try and motivate you. The question as asked is to determine whether in two, three, four, five years maximum, we will still have a job or whether you will be completely useless. So get prepared to read some books and my books, because I have a lot of uh, adult children and I still have a lot of expenses. So hopefully you'll have some free time to read my books. Now, this round table is absolutely magnificent and they're going to explain the future to us. We'll start directly with a, finance, a financial expert who has a wonderful first name. Finance was my first profession. I should have stayed in finance. His name is Gonzague. Are there still uh, traders or only machines in the financial world? I'm not saying that traders and uh, don't have a heart. No, I've understood your question. First thing, what you need to understand about the financial world is that finance has huge resources. So it's probably the sector where innovation and technology is really at the cutting edge. The finance sector has the necessary capital, and whenever they can find a niche, they meet and jump into the niche because they're interested in making money, then uh, yes, they will be enthusiastic. So yes, you're right. The markets have changed. Markets have changed. But what you don't see around you probably is that when you go home and you look and you say, oh my, what's happening on the stock, mar stock market? The journalist has no idea. 50 to 70 percent of the volumes are uh, traded by algorithms today. They work the market the way they want. And they're completely disconnected from the fundamentals. So people are going to find an explanation because there was an article in the Financial Times or a member of a, a central bank has said something, but no, they have no idea. It started at 9.35 in the morning and then they worked the market the way they wanted these algorithms. So indeed, we, in the way we operate, we have to identify the enemy and figure out how it works. So momentarily there will be in a, a relation with dollars and with the oil prices it's completely disconnected but that's the way it is interest rates are going to impact the banks etc that's the way the stock market is today so the question is is it just rumor or is it real the theory is that it's rumor in the long term i met a listed company CFO who said, you know, Gonzague, this is what I have. I'm starting here, and this is where I'm going in terms of worth. And that's how the market works. He's right, because he's on a niche market. There was a play on words there between niche and a, a dog's den. So what is the resistance of the lead, therefore? What is the size of the lead and what is the resistance of the lead? Now, if we look at the current state of affairs, it's clear that so we've got these algorithms, frequency trading, systematic models, so different complex animal names that correspond to other types of algorithms, systems, smart battles. Finance is great if you want to find innovation doesn't mean to say that, you know, you have don't have credit crunches, crises happening like the one in 2008, but it's all about innovation. So we're talking about two things. At the time, we were talking about discretionary management as opposed to systematic management. So discretionary, that's us with market ideas. Systematic, that's the computer. We've always had that combat. Now we're always where we talk about passive management, nobody in the aeroplane, and active management, and billions are being injected into this. So to answer your question in your sector, 
it's a bit like David against Goliath. David is losing uh, ground. All of the people that I was, I had respect for, footballers, uh, Formula One drivers, uh, even some big traders, they had exceptional performance, but their performance has stopped. They're, they don't need anything financially. Simply, it doesn't work. Their performance is well below expectations, and so they're being replaced by computers. And here's a word that I'd like to share with you. We heard it in the press. Manning Group, $405 billion, says the following. 50% I'll give it to people. It's discretionary. 50% I'll put that into algorithms in IT. And in that 50%, 50% is going into artificial intelligence. So this is it. We can see the beast on the horizon. Now I'll let the others say something because it is a major issue. What is artificial intelligence, including in finance? Everything you've seen up until now, Luc Ferry talked about film techs, these famous things, robots that diagnose what you have, or look at life expectancy, take into account whether you're a smoker, whether you have children, all of that's very well. But how, what should your portfolio look like for your future retirement? That's just econometrics based on temporality. We live in the world of algorithms, but not in the world of artificial intelligence. Many things um, are not concerned yet. We mustn't confuse things. This is what we call in our field data mining. So you collect series of figures, information, you put them together, and you deduce things from them. That's all well and good. But we're not talking about a computer that can learn things like Iron Man, because man still has a role to play. And I'd like to talk about something else later on, the, the, what, what is going to follow on from that. So let's talk about orders of magnitude and the relativity of actions. How, how long do we keep shares today? Because we're going to be talking about time. Well, you know, you have new animals like eye frequency. Eye frequency, what is it? Well, there's something called renaissance. It, they may they may be making 40% a year for 10 years. It's true, to such an extent that they've got rid of all of their customers and they just manage things for themselves. And we're talking about billions, billions. But there's just something uh, that uh, I'm wondering about, and I've been thinking about it. You've got cars. Very soon, we're not going to be allowed to drive them, so we're going to have driverless cars. And then soon there will be no longer passengers, because they'll, so there'll just be traffic jams with empty vehicles. So it's basically the same thing that we're talking about. The problem with finance. This is my humanism coming out. So we'll, sham will still last, but sham uh, will no longer last two days, but 360 days. So finance is different. I'm not saying that it's just a game. You know, I give you a, an apple, uh, you give it back to me for such and such an amount, and, and it's all about self-enrichment. There are things to earn and gain. So there are always losers and winners in that game. So you can't optimize things like the driverless car because it means that we're all going in the same direction. So the niche... So we're already at the stage where robots self-destruct. If I've got a niche and we've got a phenomenon and we want to focus on it, it's going to be identified so the margins will go down because everybody will notice it. It's really the extreme of uh, the creative prediction. It's, it's the general theory of suicide. Yes, but as long as I'm winning, I continue to play and I move on to the next theme and so on and so forth. So there's a complete defamation of the market such that many managers no longer recognize their babies. I won't go into the details, but they, everything's been deformed. Nevertheless, they are nevertheless subject to problems. Let me cite a number of these. In 2014, uh, uh, there was a tweet, Obama attack. It was a fake news. 
but the computers, I don't have time to look at the news, um, the action was very fast. There was a drop in the Wall Street value, a 20 uh, trillion, 300 billion dollars lost in the space of a few seconds because of a false tweet. Nobody s saw it happening, so it, it can really hurt. There was the flash crash in May 2010. The computers uh, did the algorithms. Somebody was accused, whether that was wrong or right, I don't know. I think the, 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 you know, the person was a scapegoat. It was an English person. And it's true, and you're going to be more shocked than you might think. The computer had sent out 10,000 orders on the biggest market in the world, the, the biggest index. 10,000 orders were sent out. So the markets were manipulated. Now, the stock exchange that day, I, I will never forget 1997, 22% within the space of a day. I was 27. I will, I'll never remember that. It's a historic uh, point. So 7%, there was a 7% drop, and there was nothing. The computers just overworked. Now, luckily, they cancelled all of the operations that had been carried out because Computers change fast, but the computer was ready to sell Procter & Gamble for below zero if it could. So we stopped everything, we cancelled everything, and the young person was uh, seen as the guilty party. When the American authorities called him in and uh, the Chicago House of Tread said, go fuck yourself, I'm sorry. This is not what you say to American authorities, it took five years. Uh, and they made 50 million. He was extradited to the United States, and he was accused, uh, uh, and he's, it's still ongoing. So, there are perverse effects, and there are many other effects that I won't cite. Every day, the high frequency has problems. And then the markets were deformed again. Again, it's not all about artificial intelligence. It's all about algorithms and data mining. So we'll come back to the key differences between algorithms and um, AI. Now, right, right, uh, the law. I spent uh, 20 years in the Council of State uh, because somebody entered, allowed me to enter, and I learned a bit of case uh, law. So the. the I looked at the collection of decisions, administrative decisions. Nobody cared about case law. Is the judge still useful today? That's my question for Marie. You're an attorney at law. Are lawyers still going to be necessary? Are they going to be asking for even more money in the future? Uh, so am I jumping to your conclusion? No. Thank goodness for that. So what happened? You're right. Artificial intelligence has entered a uh, lawyer's office. This was in May 2016. Al Ross is an algorithm that was developed by IBM. It's founded on Watson. So it arrived in lawyer's offices, and we thought that the intelligent lawyer had happened and that we would lose our jobs, uh, that the algorithm would be able to analyze all of the case law and give us within the space of a minute, to have an answer and a, a legal analysis. That's true, but Ross is not what lawyers do. Lawyers do many things. There are different components. They do a technical, legal analysis of things. You start with a technical and legal analysis so that you can provide high added value counseling. What does Ross do? Ross makes it possible to analyze in a very fast manner, different legal documents to give a first answer, a first response, and a first strategic reading of a situation to a lawyer, putting forward a number of options based on case law, based on regulatory texts, and then it uh, acts as a super assistant or documentalist. The cognitive processing of information is what the lawyer does. The lawyer has the capacity to think about the technical problem and to put it back into context, to use their own sensitivity, their own knowledge of the matter. It's the lawyer who sets up the strategy, if we're talking about a, a litigation, to take the decision to go before the judge or not in order to obtain uh, damages. 
So if we take the process, what I'm interested in here is uh, the changes to jobs. So we have the very example here of the destruction of, let's say, the the, the average class of, of skills. So we could buy uh, people working on documents. So either you've got 18 years of studies or no, you've got the uh, the ones with 18 years of studies and the slaves. There's nothing in the in between. I don't know about slaves. I don't really know what you mean by slaves. A slave is somebody who costs less than a machine, basically. Well, there's a f there was a first revolution in lawyers' offices, and that was the revolution linked to IT. Lawyers, up until the 90s, all had a personal assistant. You had in an office, you had the lawyers and the assistant who dealt with all of the information. Artificial intelligence, uh, rather, well, algorithms, rather than intelligence itself, impacts two legal jobs, the paralegal field and the documentary field. These uh, high added value algorithms mean that uh, lawyers' office have to rethink the way they manage things. But that doesn't mean to say that the documentary researcher disappears. Perhaps that researcher will have to change. Uh, their job will change according to requirements. Because if you take uh, Watson learning based on non-structured data, you can have a certain amount of loss or errors that have to be validated. And then we move back over to a human process, human processing of the information. The documentary researcher needs to know what their position is if they want to anticipate the revolution linked to algorithmic research. When we have discussions together, notably with Guy, and we want to know whether robots are going to destroy doctors or, on the contrary, they're going to, uh, they're going to increase the added value of doctors. So this is what's happening in your field. The lawyer can be fairly average, uh, look at case law. Uh, now all of that can be done by a machine. But it's like going from genetics to epigenetics. You know, what do you have in between? What about the other players involved, the magistrate, the judge, etc.? So for two or three years now, we've been seeing a certain number of legal startups. Now it's the same thing here. The legal startup is on the law market, and we thought, my God, they're going to uh, get rid of us. The legal startup, in fact, is different. It is allowed to, it can put forward, thanks to algorithms, the generation of a certain number of documents. Uh, so automatically, so when there is added value, the legal startup cannot provide that uh, added value it can't provide the same kind of advice as lawyers. So it's like a, a lawyerissimo, like you have doctorissimo. Yes, yes. Today, you have legal startups that help uh, people to fill in their legal forms, their administrative forms, before they went to see their lawyer or their accountant, but now they have everything online. That doesn't mean to say, uh, given this phenomenon, that we have to rethink the job that we do that we no longer have a role to play because of these automatic tasks um, that can be done by a machine. So I'll see what else I can do. I can see how I can advise my customer in a, in a more uh, detailed manner using my competence and expertise. Okay, thank you very much. Now let's talk about medicine. Are you uh, still useful? I like to ask that question here. Well, yes, I think we're still useful. Uh, the, the, yes, we are useful. I think the real subject when it comes to artificial intelligence is, you know, what kind of medicine are we talking about? Let me carry out a survey. There are 250 interns, students, uh, and artificial intelligence. So uh, Some might be interested in genetics, but the 250 students don't really understand what artificial intelligence is. They might talk about robotics, but it is a field in medicine that is, uh, and we're not talking about finance, but when you uh, question startups and what have you, they say, well, pharmacy 
it's minus three in relation to the bank and medicine today, hospitals were at minus seven, minus eight. So there's a real subject. We haven't integrated that at all. The students don't understand. There's nothing about this subject. So artificial intelligence, at least its algorithmic level, does help. I think that it does raise the question of what kind of medicine are we talking about? So we're talking about freedom of decision making. Now, this, this title shocks me because a doctor is there to decide or is the doctor there to build a decision? Our current medicine, it's based on acts, and, but there's also an interpersonal relation with the patient. There are complementary medicines because there's the problem of interpersonal relations sometimes. But this is something that's considered, it's criticized as not being constructed enough. So coming back to artificial intelligence, is it it's there to replace radio, um, x-ray analyses, uh, examination analyses, uh, putting uh, forward uh, treatment plans. So we're going to be losing out uh, on our role as doctor. If, but the role of the doctor, we can imagine that it's a different role, a different vision. And artificial intelligence should give us the possibility of having the freedom to build a decision, build up a decision with the patient. It's not like the, it's not the same thing as the freedom to decide. The doctor is not there to have the freedom to decide. He's there to put forward an idea. It's the, with the patient. The patient comes along. I see the patient. I'm a surgeon. Here I am. Uh, you're a, a, you have a disability, but they go on internet. They look at they look at everything. They have incredible knowledge. So we're there to build things with the patient. So artificial intelligence, how is it going to give us that opportunity to say, okay, we can build a decision. We can build a decision. That means several things. It means that if we take multiple data, often complicated data, artificial intelligence can manage such uh, data. They're there to put forward ideas. There's never one solution, one truth. And that solution, these multiple solutions, this this... We can't know them all. I just do multidisciplinary consultations. There are between five and ten doctors. And we see lots of dis disabled people. And we build together. And there are different ideas that are put forward by the different people involved. So this building of the decision, thanks to artificial intelligence, is what we're talking about. We don't want to forget about uh, some kind of case. So we can be much more, much better in the way we build a decision. And that building is uh, the decision is important because the decision is very complex. You've got to take into account different things, multiple factors, social factors, environmental, religious factors, and then there's a the notion of time. What we say one day is not the same as what we should say an hour later. So I think we, we're very lucky. Artificial intelligence challenges us fundamentally uh, with the respect to our conception of medicine. So we have to consider that like always in a project, you've got to give meaning. It's not the technology that's going to do that. Technology itself doesn't mean anything. It's what kind of medicine do we want? Is it that complex medicine that we want? We were talking about that this morning. We're going to build to have real uh, projects. Now, how do you assess the satisfaction? It's going to be based on contracts in the future. So we do things that are, are functional, but the, the uh, assess you can think about assessment scaling. What is the contract for? Is it just to uh, just to pick your nose? Is it just so that you've got something pretty? No, we're going to enter into a medicine based on restrictions where the obligation of results is going to be a key theme. And we're very lucky with artificial intelligence. It's there to help us to build the best possible solution with the patient. And the second element that I find very uh, interesting is the notion of time. Hello. It's the time. So the approach these days is to make, lack time, to be, have a relationship with patients. Patients say we don't have any time anymore. Don't we have an opportunity for our, our artificial intelligence to help us, give us time? Not not just time because we're going to be in front of the computer more. Uh, people are rather, rather, young people are right away on their computers. We will be, maybe we'll be more efficient with that time. There's a very uh, interesting study by Accenture that said that they could imagine that 21% of medical time would work better um, if we would save 20, maybe 20, 20, 20, 20% more time to devote to relationships. And then there's the time in your head. For the doctor, what, what, what bothers us, I don't know how everybody says, but what really, uh, you know, I don't like to think that maybe I missed a solution for a patient. And to say that at that time, we would have been able to reflect and 
often collectively with con construction of this decision, which uh, gives a piece, certain peace of mind. Here's something that's very interesting, something very intelligent with, interesting with AI. It challenges us on the relationships. We've construct, built our organizations on the people of knowledge and power. We have to break all that down. It's finished. Knowledge uh, will go onto our machine and we can find it. Uh, we're going to go into an era of competence and skill. And so then the nurse or they, they have a lot of information and can have access to information just like the patient. So it gives a new uh, opportunity for collective speech. Uh, let's say each person speaks because that's the compl com complexity that we're being faced with the AI. It's it's important for to have a patient's opinion, but also the opinion of his girlfriend or of the uh, another professional. All he's um, if we use this AI, this time that we'll be able to recreate by giving by letting people speak, we'll see that this complexity people have to be able to talk to each other differently. No, no longer in hierarchical attitude. We see that things are changing, that things are overturning, and so either we tolerate it. And we we live in, in um, either either we suffer from technology or we we use artificial intelligence to challenge us. And in the and the direction that we want for our profession is it a hum, humanist profession built with the patient collective that that matures in time. And in that case, AI will give us an opportunity, an extraordinary opportunity to ask these questions because. That gives us even more sense. And since we know um, it's necessarily going to change things, it's going to break up in institutions, the personnel. We have to explain to the personnel. You know, if we tell people we're going to cut down jobs because we're bringing more al algorithms, but but if we tell them it's going to give us better sense, a, a better vision of a better profession, we're going to come back to true medicine, medicine where. I'll give you an example to make myself understand well. When I see someone comes in and we have we put up the uh, the the, the x-ray that's now what we want to hear the person we want to hear the person walking we want to hear the person doing gym, gym, gymnastics the, the x x ray is in the subject the the x-ray the subject is what does the patient want I think we have a great opportunity with AI to say we have lots of solution it's going to help us to create time and to build collectively a decision for the patient and to finish up my last point I think that AI uh, we have to have an uh, re evolution ourselves. It, it allows us to um, manage time intelligently, to look at prevention. I'm tired of this. We have a lot of works in the handicapped work. In the past, I looked at the, we looked at the geriatrics. We look we 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 handle emergencies. We handle care, and it's also for the most vulnerable. And I have considerable hope is that with the AI AI and algorithms, we'll be able to first of all. And it should be one of our priorities to say how will this allow us to to help the most vulnerable people to anticipate, and with the most vulnerable people to avoid uh, finding ourselves in a type of very situation uh, which uh, which we see every day. Yes, I think it's a continual opportunity that we challenge ourselves fundamentally on what we want as medicine. If we don't we if we don't change our medicine. I think if we keep medicine as it is now, we're going to have problems in the future, and we will suffer. Uh, and in 50 years, we'll, we'll be saying, you know, um, the, we have a very sad profession. So it's, it's it's quite fascinating from that point of view that we often talk about um, optimistic point of view. But we say that uh, so there are algorithms. Uh, we'll talk about algorithms first, and then the artificial intelligence. And what about the human life, or is it human life? So we're, so there were two points. Two comparisons that came to mind: the Snow White, this, this queen in, in in Snow White, who says, "I'm the be most beautiful, I'm the best," and someone comes along and says, "Nope, that's not true." So now you have to challenge yourself because no one no one was coming along who's prettier than you are, and you combine this with with what Cocteau was saying: "Be careful, um, because the mirrors think," and I have the impression in what you're saying, it's true. We had the exact same reflection. We'll come back to finance. The custom of the law came back to that. We have to think about what you were used for. You had a kind of procedure, and you could say that the algorithm was the old world. You were kind of used a kind of procedure, um, and you were devoid, and you didn't have to reflect. So the algorithm was the old world, and not the new algorithm, 
which gives gives no time more time. So IBM. So IBM, what are you doing these days? Because IBM created all kinds of things. Um, so we have the impression that you you guys do something. So so what do you do? Yes, we work. You know, I say, what what are, you, what are you doing there? I'm ready to invest. Um, you know, I have to buy IBM. Should I, should I buy? I don't know. We'll, we'll ask Gonzag. Yeah, he's probably more qualified than me to say that. But um, so what do we do? Um, we have an illustration in the legal world. And to come back to what Philippe was saying, we're trying to be in the service of people like Philippe. That's to say that we're trying to build tools that will increase your ability to decide, that will increase your ability to to integrate all of the data, that there, that there are masses of them everywhere, from connected objects, from publications, from social networks, from everything you want, um, and to bring all this into your medical practice. So that's what, your, that's what the aim is. We, have, we are far from having done this. But before going into the details, I wanted to go back to the title of our conference, which is Artificial Intelligence. What, free, what freedom of decision will we have? There's a word that I like here. It's not artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is freedom or liberty. If we can do AI, if it isn't useful to uh, for helping increase liberty of people, then we're on the wrong track and we're doing the wrong thing. Let's remember the general principles. I would like to simplify, uh, simplify things a bit, maybe a, bit character, a bit of a character, but but others we may fall asleep. Let's remember, let's keep the technologies in the service of, of people. As Gonzaga said, may, maybe there are questions for managers that we were talking about earlier to know whether what they're doing really makes sense. Fine, freedom is what? Is the ability to make choices. So how do we make these choices? Do we make choices or informed choices? Is to, to, to say the choice, you, 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 you Either you clap for the leader of North Korea when he's making speech because you don't have a choice, or or, or you make an informed decision. An inf informed decision can be made if you have intelligence. And how can you use this intelligence? We use this intelligence if we have knowledge and data. How do we provide these data and this knowledge? That's the whole debate of training. A long time ago, we had to have all the data in your head uh, before printing. But, uh, Eric, you know... Um, <laughs> Yeah, we're doing some co-working now. So AI will have to, to um, you know, so, so now I can, uh, I can say, I can address uh, Eric Austin in a very familiar way. Just make sure that your wife buys my books. Uh, no, it's the market. Uh, my, my attitudes aren't sexist, it's just the market. Three, three, four, three, four, three of my, three quarters of my readers are women, and that's one of the reasons why I write. <laughs> it's one of the reasons I like writing. Sorry, go ahead. So it's sure that in IT we have a bit of a deficit in, in terms of uh, equality between men and women, but that's the debate of training and and education. But in, and data and data we had the rhythm originally we had them in your in your head with printing. We didn't need to have them in your head so much, and that's what some people think. Uh, that's what led to the Enlightenment. But now we're at the next level. We have the Internet, which is taking care of data even better. Uh, we have immediate immediate response and we have exhaustiveness than, rather than any library. But also with the artificial intelligence, we're starting, to, we're starting to attack knowledge. We have knowledge tools, which will allow professionals to act, make decisions by subcontracting part of their knowledge. Now, is this... Do we have to delegate these choices to AI, personally? You know, I'm, I may not be at IBM anymore today, but, but I say no. It's, it's not the aim. I'm, I'm joking, joking, of course. The vision of IBM is not to, to replace human beings um, to, to take the place of their brain, but rather to propose tools, regardless of their profession, to make so that they can do their job in a better way with, a, with more maneuvering margin and a more informed way. So we're going to delegate part of what we did with our intelligence to tools, but we're going to we're not going to do it blindly. We need a new skill, which I call which I call meta intelligence. Now when we had data on the internet, we needed metadata. We we needed to know if it was fake news or not. I'm I'm surprised that uh, in, in the in the big brains that manage uh, finance that, that they um they're, they're, they can be surprised by fake data. So the big, first criterion in big data 
in medicine too is if we're going to do something, uh, whether we're going to be um, doing something that's bullshit, we have to decide whether our data is good or not. If we don't know this, we, then we amplify data where we don't know what we're doing with them. It's ridiculous. But surprising, but it's also dangerous. In the case that you mentioned earlier, uh, it's also clearly dangerous with uh, when you're treating patients. So this this made the position. We need it for data to know on the um, internet we have fake data or not. Some people are starting to work on this. We have to react to this. But we're going to have the same thing with intelligence, uh, with AI. We'll be able to, we have to, to learn things in our training to, to have this intelligence method which allows us to know um, who has the intelligence and, and, and what kind of AI do we have uh, faced with. We aren't obliged to always use uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, as Marie said, sometimes we had results that are wrong because because the systems are probabilistic. They're going to analyze, as they could, uh, all of the massive data that they collected, and they're going to give a probability to your results. Uh, it might be 95% or 97%, but the real interest is to say that is that the machine versus the person, the real interest value is the machine plus the human being, the two complete each other. M Marie illustrated this by saying that the lawyers uh, review things, and Philip illustrated this as well. For me, uh, I'm quite reassured that people, uh, I, I like to have something that helps me to check that, that I haven't forgotten something because because I forgot it or or because I was tired. Uh, may ha maybe my reasoning wasn't always right because I know the person very much and I, I like this person very much. Uh, well, this, then this can happen in everyone's life, whether you're a doctor or anyone else. So by having this position with metadata and meta choices, we're going to make choices and we're going to use artificial intelligence in an informed manner. And if we consider that it's going to release part of our brain, it's going to be very interesting because we'll be able to, we'll be able to have a, a digital enlightenment or, or, or digital enlightenment. And since uh, since the, since there are apparently 500 decision makers in this room, I hope that everyone in this room is ready to make choices and to to make suggestions. And um, so this is what I, what, what I mean by that. My, we want to say this is my objective. I want to pursue this, ob pursue my objective, depending on my profession, um, uh, whether it's curing cancer or treating people or whatever else. And then I can look at what the AI, uh, what we prefer, uh, what we, we prefer to call augmented intelligence at IBM. If it helps with something, well, then I'll use it. If it doesn't, uh, then I'll throw it away. Whereas it helps, if it's something that helps me to do my profession, then I'll keep it. It's as simple as that. Can we say? that uh, we'll come back to finances. We'll let Guy speak first. Can we say that with with the uh, algorithms and AI? The, to the tools that we have at their disposal right now will, uh, will help us to, one, to draft, uh, to look at the broadest range of possibilities, not to, not to forget a hypothesis, or not to overlook a hypothesis, so we're, we're, Uh, so we have all of the possibilities and all of the what, why nots, and we also have time for to make, to make choices. So, so the choice of time is possible. So we have it's possible the time and the time for the choice. So, so I'm going to let Guy speak now, because you've been reflecting a lot on this, especially this morning, with the excellent article in Lego. What's your position? And do you think that we are we going forward? Are are the patients such that is is the situation such that we aren't advancing? On the other side, on the, the internet, which is it could be any whether or not there are attention and and there's calm, um, plots and and there's all kinds of big farm and big data, but but fake news as well. So where are we in this dynamism that that you were one of the first to to identify? First, first of all, our deal with them, you know, if, no, I had to read up on what an algorithm was because I looked at it from different, um, but there was a, an Uzbek a mathematician in the 10th century uh, who came up with this term, and so I had to look it up and research it. But like a certain number of other surgers, surgeons and robotics and the tool, development of the tools that they're that are surrounding us more and more. I discovered that I work. I work by algorithm. By algorithm, 
when I'm doing my diagnosis. Um, doctors use algorithms because he gets elements, he, he, he brings them together, groups them, and, and to come up with two or three hypotheses, and, and hopefully he'll make the right decision. So right off the bat, the machine is going to replace me very quickly if that's what we're going to do. Because it will look for, it will look at all hypotheses, and some of them I might forget, and it will make sense in them. So it'll probably give me a diagnosis with IBM. You have a 98% success rate with, uh, with, with your decisions. In the domain of recommendation, uh, therapeutic and cancerology, we've done comparisons uh, with some of blind tests, and we, we have concordance rates with, uh, with uh, multidisciplinary uh, teams, with decision-making places, and applied treatments. We have rates uh, up to, to from 75 to 96%. So 96%, it wasn't far. But if we, two different hospitals, we will have the same concordance, obviously. Why? Because as Philip says, there's not just one possible avenue. But what about the range of the sufficiency? The machine will always, no, we're not worried about them. But in certain domains, in certain domains, why? Why was Kasparov beat by Big Blue, and and other people were beaten by these computers? It's because it's because they com computed through millions and billions of games. But me, I play chess, not not necessarily well, but I also play I play ch I play checkers and I play poker and I play all kinds of things, and so, and so sometimes I can talk them with my uh, with my um, neighbor and have a glass of whiskey and scratch my nose at the same time. But I don't see a robot being able to do that. There's still a long to do, still a long long way to go. And you, and you don't know the cards of the other people. Not only are we going to be considerably assisted by diagnostics in terms of the treatment indications, you know, if you have a two tumor that you biopsy because uh, the biopsy, you know, uh, and then we look at the, the pathologist looks at it and the, and the pathologist says, um, but if we, if we look at the geno genotype, it's not the three, billions, three millions uh, choices in the genotype for the database that I'm going to be able to analyze, but the computer will be able to do it. So I'm going to shift that, this indication for the treatments, and we are increasingly, uh, we, we are, right, right now we handle things electronically, but I want to, but I want to uh, develop a, uh, an automated system for, for we just have to decide on the volumes that we have to use on the scanner and the echo, and the machine will do everything. And, and we will have treatment factories where there were 300 patients with an engineer or operator who will su supervise the machines. This is the direction we're going in. We won't escape this because the machine's never tired. It's never depressed. It's never drunk. It works 24 hours a day. And it does things better. It will do certain very programmed gestures better than we do for simple pathologies. But the basic question is that we based medicine on the prowess of the technical act, whereas now the prowess will be the compromise to find, will we'll completely change the paradigm. It's a different paradigm. You're talking about the paradox of compromise. That That's what marriage means to me. That's marriage. No, it's a multiple experience. That's what I wanted to say. So, the question that I find is fascinating in the title. The title of our roundtable was, what liberty of, of decision will remain? So, diagnosis, we will lose it mainly, uh, therapeutic indications. But, but the most beautiful thing is human relations that will remain. I don't see a patient with cancer who will be uh, uh, the machine saying, please take this, please take that. I can't imagine that. That's my role. As a doctor, I will still keep my experience and an immense empathy. And there are little signs that you recognize when you're, uh, uh, the doctor is uh, with the patient during the visit. There's not any artificial intelligence that can do that. That's all that is remaining to us. And that's a very small portion. It has huge consequences. There's no point in increasing the number of doctors because in 15 years, if we train too many young doctors, we'll have unemployed doctors. I promise you, we will have surgeons who will not be working. It's going to move very fast. 
So we need to reduce the number of doctors to remain with this ultimate decision-making in partnership with machines and the personnel that works with us. That's the evolution of medicine. It's an absolute uh, calling into question of the, the doctor as a guru who, who tells other people to do things. No, no, we're going to share with machines. I'd like to react to what Guy just said. It's a vision that can frighten people, but if robots are well designed, maybe we could do totally efficient prostate operations prostate operations, and that's not the case today. But there will still be some things that remain. Who's going to design these machines? With what knowledge? You? Your teams? Yes, it's you. So you'll have humans involved in that. Absolutely. And you can't believe that the machine's going to be able to operate alone. Today we're using artificial intelligence that we describe as low level or weak. And we're very far from strong artificial intelligence. What does this mean? Well, they're still under the control of people. They're there to accomplish a very precise objective and nothing else. The machine that will operate on the prostate won't say, oh, I'm sick of operating prostates. I'm going to do silicone implants in, in women's breasts. But it could be tempting. But the machine won't be able to do it. So it's assigned to a specific purpose. But we need to verify that there's no drift, no deviation, that as it's learning with this auto uh, learning, that it doesn't drift away from uh, high performance. Guy and his colleagues may have new ideas to make the machine even better. And this is what we'll call the maintenance of the artificial intelligence that they'll do themselves. Let me come back to artificial intelligence. I can't remember if we use the tutoiement or the vouvoiement in French. Please wear friends. But I just wanted to, before you go any further, I would like to say you, Pascal, asked this question. Now, there are areas where there are sanctions. And there are false things and then true things. And then in the area s such as finance, there are false things that create real things. So since I worked on La Fontaine, I found something that La Fontaine wrote in this, his poem called The Statue of Jupiter. So I wanted to salute Jupiter because he was here last year. That's the nickname that we use for our French president. So. This is what each, and then you can answer true or false. Each one, in reality, uses his own dreams. A man is frozen to truth, and then he's on fire for lies. So dear Gonzague, as a finance specialist, are you not totally on fire when it comes to lies? So someone who can be, well, I'm delighted that you just gave me the floor. I've listened to all of you. I tried to reflect on this before I came. Even if Einstein said, I think he, he said that the IQ of traders was in the last, the lowest category of IQs, he felt that we were a, a detestable profession, traders. But I agree with many things that you've said. We didn't talk about artificial intelligence much. We talked mainly about algorithms, and that's always the question. An algorithm that will help us, and I totally agree with you. This is what certainly, and I won't talk about the, the medium level in terms of jobs. Medium levels will disappear, and they're disappearing in the finance sector. And the, But what about truth and lies? And then we'll come back to truth and lies, what is true and false. I wanted to talk about disruption, too. The consequences that there will be tomorrow, if you look at Kodak and the Polaroid companies, the world is going fast. So what things that are at absolute the pinnacle may uh, collapse tomorrow because the technological revolution is now the digital re revolution and things are moving so fast. But I totally agree with many things that you said. Let's just identify a few words. Intuition, you said. Emotion. Sixth sense awareness and uh, the subconscious. None of this is possible in artificial intelligence or you would replicate the brain and I'm not a doctor, but I don't think you're, you're there yet. But let me give you an example, two examples. Everyone is worried about what we call the Phillips curve when you study economics. It's the relation between inflation and the unemployment rate. So the lower the unemployment, then people ask for more higher salaries 
and then there's inflation. The draggy, nobody can, can figure this out because there's this disruption. Something happened. There's a real disruption. Your computer, no matter how intelligent it is, let me use Groupman's definition. He said, 25% of my assets will be managed by computers that I that will be learning themselves. And that's true. So what's the computer going to say? Well, it says, well, there is a real disruption, but the computer doesn't have the solution. The solution, you will find it with your intuition. It's uh, Archimedes in his bathtub. And let me give you another example. When I was in London, they had quantic al algorithms that were working very well in Europe and the US. And then in 2010, there was the crisis, the Euro crisis, the Greek crisis in Dubai. And they unplugged everything because everything was collapsing. And I had a discussion with the guy and he said, well, what's happening? Is there a doubt? There's a doubt about Europe. So we're adding a risk premium. At the time, everything was horizontal. Telefonique in Spain had the same worth as France Telecom in France and Deutsche Telekom in Germany. At Telecom Italia, and all of a sudden the market began to understand that, well, in Spain, I'm not safe. It's risky. So I'm going to add a risk premium. I don't want to pay the same price. But your computer, artificial intelligence, didn't understand that. So this is what happens. This is, you can't integrate it in artificial intelligence because it's a new phenomenon. It's a total disruption. Okay, well, I have another example of this point that's very clear. The climate question, when you go from two to two and a half degrees, that's not just the extension of one and a half degrees to two. It has nothing to do with it. It's another universe. So we're going to continue. The computer is going to look at 1.5 uh, in growth and increase, and we see what's happening with this regular increase. So when you're in a new world, you, the artificial intelligence can't master this. Well, how do you distinguish what's true from what's false? Yes, for you. For us. Well, in your life. What about in your personal life? I'm a novelist. I'm a novelist, so I... Well, you can write a novel on lives such as ours. Well, it is, it is difficult. We are faced with markets that we have less control of. Gonzague in, 20, in 2008, I had a great performance, and I can't replicate it today, and I can't deal uh, the way I did uh, 10, 20 years ago. I'm faced with an alien that modifies the entire paradigm. But there is a limit, and I have to adapt. And I still have the idea, and I'm not extremely reactionary. I think when you play with fire, you burn yourself. You can't eliminate these cycles of contract yet. You can't eliminate this concept of the bubble. They're doing this on the Bitcoin. It's going to be very painful. These cryptocurrencies are completely stupid. You can't eliminate these bubbles that we saw with the subprimes in 2008. So these are cycles. Why? Let me describe one thing. Man is made in such a way. People love things. They bring them to a pinnacle. Then they destroy them and burn them. Keynes said three things that I love. The only certainty that you have is that we'll all be dead in the future. Okay? That's number one. Nobody can test that, even doctors. Secondly, he describes the markets. It's the dog's leash story. You have to have the capacity to be m solvent for a longer time than the market will be irrational. Markets are crazy. They're irrational. They go into the extremes. So we have 14 minutes and 53 seconds to determine what new step we're going to reach, what new stage awaits us. So uh, we're talking about algorithms that are more or less sophisticated. We weren't even talking about artificial intelligence. What do you think is the next step? And is it good for uh, to inject more humanity or less? Is it not increasing uh, more possibilities for us? Or is it just replacing humans? Well, what I wanted to say on this topic is that artificial strong artificial intelligence doesn't exist yet. It exists to create new uh, professions, and that's what we call tragic future uh, forecasters, f futurology. They, they earn a lot of money, but 
whether you're a futurologist or a reactionary, if you add the word tragic, I, I know. I know who you're referring to. I have some names. It's like the dot-com bubble. If you called your company dot-com, or if you if you put Shidlai or Wea, your your company is is uh, worth more. So at IBM, we prefer talking about augmented intelligence, and not artificial intelligence, because it's a choice made by society. It's a choice that we propose to society as a whole, and it's the choice of the company to say we want to design tools for medicine and other sectors that are intended for professionals and that allow them to work more intelligently and free up time to exercise their own intelligence. So release part of the left-hand part of the brain for intellectual, automatable, rational tasks and also liberate some time for the right-hand brain that we've completely ignored and certainly in the medical world. And you talk about that a little bit because you're very sensitive to this. But in a macroscopic fashion, we can say that uh, medicine has become very technological, and it's a good thing because we've made a lot of progress. But now we could perhaps go back in the other direction and say, let's take some time to reflect and to breathe. I in, ideally would like to offer doctor systems that will allow them to take ten minute, a 10-minute break three or four times during the day to do what they want, to take a breather, to meditate. Maybe I'm a hippie here in my philosophy, but I think we need to attempt this before saying it's just a, a, a hippie's theory. Well, let's try it. Let's let's do a con maybe conscious breathing and see if it works. And let's see if patients, if we m measure patient satisfaction, maybe they'll be more satisfied, even if the treatment is the same, or maybe the treatment will change. But maybe patients will have a better patient experience. You were talking about the future, tomorrow. Well, we have to start working on it now. I think tomorrow there's, there are already experiments that exist. We're very late in the medical sector. We can't imagine that in all of our facilities we don't say, how are we going to introduce these new possibilities, whether it's through research or through classical clinical trials or uh, training. We can't avoid this. I think tomorrow we must redesign the curriculum in medical school. We must stop judging doctors on their knowledge. The field of skills is essential. Look at what the Canadians are doing in CalMed. These are skills that we will need to be able to manage this approach, which is necessarily a different one and uh, extremely humanistic. It's very interesting. I think we're really at the crossroads. It's a turning point, and I think we are. It is a vision of uh, new medicine and new health care. And I think we have a real problem. It's a collective problem in terms of the decision makers and especially the medical teams to say, what medicine do we want? This industrialization finally will allow us to do real individualized, customized medicine. It's no longer individual. It'll be uh, a collective work with a patient. And this is a fundamental change. So the challenge right now is today, after we go home today, tomorrow, how can we collectively work on this? It's tomorrow. It's coming tomorrow. And artificial intelligence, what usage do we want to make of it for this conception we have of healthcare? Just one minute, I'd like to add something. It's almost like Europe. The tools don't are neutral with respect to the choices. So it's up to us to decide what we want to do with the tools. If you take a diagnosis support tool, what are we going to do with this system? Are we going to use it for the first opinion and then 50% failure, we don't care? Do we put it? Do we use it as a second opinion, medical opinion, to complete the first opinion or a third opinion to replace a human being and then keep or third opinion in addition to two uh, doctor's opinions, that's possible. We could organize this. We can make the choices that correspond. So what about the law tomorrow? Well, there are many answers and many things that are possi possible. Imagine the super prosecutor who calls up Watson, the doctor, to the bar, and the super prosecutor doesn't know the law of algorithms and artificial intelligence. Why? Because when he analyzes structured data, 
the answers to new issues, such as you will have in medicine. He doesn't have them. So we'll have a trial with an intelligent prosecutor, Ross, who, with a new system of artificial intelligence or augmented intelligence. And we as lawyers, well, the future issues we will have to deal with, we've never had to deal with them in the past, the machine to serve humans and humans to serve the machine and a whole uh, scheme of responsibility behind this that's linked to it. So in five years, what would I like to be as a lawyer? I would like to be at the court of assize for the first trial of Watson to defend Watson, maybe against IBM, maybe I will maybe I will sue IBM and say that the robot the, was not well programmed and that the data that were communicated had a certain number of, there was some fake data and false data and so the interpretation was not done correctly and to try to demonstrate that this intelligence is totally linked to people and humans and the contribution that they can make. So Watson will certainly not be responsible for the errors committed and he could have an impact on the life of your patients. So do we have a right of response to the lawyer? That's superb, thank you. Well, the way that Watson works today in oncology today, we exploit a certain number of medical publications, the literature, everything that comes out in on the web every day in oncology. We have our partners at the Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York who are going to do what they call a curing the data to avoid integrating these publications that we were talking about earlier, which are sold and have no scientific value. So they're doing this work of, and it is subjective, but at least they're doing it. So then we can, you can decide whether that's valid or not. So they're taking the patient data and then in a probabilistic fashion, they're going to suggest treatment. So they won't suggest just one treatment, but several. There can be several treatments that have similar efficacy, and it will be up to the doctor to exercise his own choice. Now, let me remind you that medical professionals are the only ones who can prescribe. There's no question that algorithms will prescribe in the future. So when he makes his choice, he will make it with the patient, discussing the adverse effects and many other things. And he will have more time to do it, and that's great. But what Watson also does is it he presents what we call evidence in English, so the proof of his reasoning. So evidence-based uh, reasoning based on articles, and that's the responsibility of the doctor. If the doctor has a doubt, he will need to check these this evidence and the documents and then exercise his own professional competency to validate or not the document. So, Marie, if you are at the trial, I will be the defense lawyer to defend IBM, I would say to you that if you have been led to apply decisions produced by Watson without having looked at the documents that he used as a basis, then in my viewpoint, it's your fault. I know. This is what I was saying. No, just a minute. So we'll hear from the banker tomorrow. Just five seconds. I'm thinking about the machine being useful to man and not the opposite. Yeah, what about the banker of tomorrow? How do you see the banker in five years' time? But it's like the Deutsche Banker. 50% of it will disappear. It's a whole restructuring that we're talking about. Do you still enjoy your job, I think the question was. What about machines that make people laugh? That's maybe what we need, real jokes. It, a computer is stupid. We need to have more laughter. It's the role of the human being. But coming back to the pure financial aspect, I'm not a Cassandra. I've been doing this for 30 years. I think there will be a bubble. The bubble will burst, and the authorities will come in and regulate, and the machine will be useful for man and not the machine running on its own. But in more concrete fields more concrete fields, uh, like medicine. I share your idea, the idea that you developed. Even if I don't have any knowledge in that field, with respect to the machine being useful to men, as uh, based on algorithms, I don't see why medicine in the future cannot uh, use that. And you were talking about patients and your relationship with them. Now, in that system, 
you know how plastic our brains are, neurologists are worried. They're saying, well, because we're forgetting memory and calculations are not doing anything, the neurons will no longer play a role. So perhaps men will uh, not be as good as they were and the machines will be augmented. So our right-hand uh, brain is becoming hypertrophied. You know that MRIs have been carried out on taxi drivers in London so to look at the hypercampus, which is a big zone of memory. And with old taxi drivers, old taxi drivers who knew all of the roads, their brain was huge. So the brain of our children is not the same as our brains with the tools that they use. So we need to keep that evolution into account. Now, we've got three minutes left. What about information in the future? Because what I'm struck by increasingly is that the world has become specialized. Now, my conviction, my absolute conviction is that We're in a religious world without any transcendence. Uh, we're, we're thinking about ourselves. We're meditating. In other words, the general ideas uh, and, and culture uh, need to be taken into account. Yeah. So we're using simulators in terms of training. They, they really do help us, these simulators. They help us to save time in terms of the the duration of studies, for example. Uh, you know, lots of medical studies are carried out to prove that we're better than others. Uh, but, but we don't need as many years to train a, a doctor. We need to learn to get the machines to work. So it's all about education as of the youngest age. And of course, uh, I'm not talking about tablets and, and making kids stupid. Lots uh, the, the people in the Silicon Valley don't want their kids to touch a tablet until they're six or seven years old. So how are kids going to learn to play with the instrument? It can be a danger, but it can also be an opportunity. So it's not easy to know. I don't have the key to that. Maybe we need to ask the specialists. Yes. And you can tell us that he's coming uh, next year, the uh, boss of IBM. Thank you. Now, here is the conclusion two uh, upheavals and three transfers. The first upheaval is more artificial intelligence. It's not intuitive. The second upheaval is more industrialization, uh, increasing what is singular. It's not intuitive. Three transfers then. Who is diminished? Who is augmented? And who is replaced? Can we summarize what we've said with these five ideas. 